I kind of realized that the commonality of, of the experiences was uh, having been the minority of minority mm. in many different contexts. And in doing so, embodying that possibility for change, yeah. but also receiving a lot of pushback. So how do we navigate gracefully? And so what could I make of these experiences? What kind of lessons, how could I provide this and offer this to other generations of change makers so that it's not loss of an experience, you know? So that was the intention at the beginning. And now it's just so crazy to think it's out there. And I've already <laughs> been to so many countries during this book tour. tour. <laughs> it's amazing. Hey, what's going on, Refi fam? John here with yet another episode of Refi Podcast. Today, I have the great pleasure of sitting down with Hene Bazad. She is a serial entrepreneur, a change maker, a public speaker, and now an author, having just released her new book, Being Other. I had an opportunity to read through this book over the last few weeks and actually listen to Hene's voice as she read it aloud on Audible. We are in an unprecedented time in human civilization where all of our systems are at the brink of collapse. And we need new models of leadership and new leaders to step up, to rise to this challenge, to overcome the trauma and transgressions of our time and to lead with compassion. In Hannah's book, she exfoliates her own journey as a black and indigenous woman of color, an Arab African standing up for what is right in the world, not only for herself, but also for all of life. She's an employee at the Sovereign Nature Initiative based here in Lisbon, doing pioneering work to finance conservation and biodiversity preservation using the power of Web3 and gaming communities online. We cover quite a lot of territory in this episode, but for me, it starts to scratch to the surface of this new model of regenerative leadership that embodies this felt sense of what it means to be human beyond this idea of a separate self and moving into the story of an interconnected web of relationships. I personally was surprised at how moved I was reading Hannah's book and sitting down with her, the depth of knowledge and wisdom that she's accrued in this part of her career so far. I hope you enjoy this conversation. There really are gems of wisdom for anybody, regardless of how you orient or affiliate yourself in the world. But particularly, I think it's important to notice how deeply unjust and how systemically biased our systems are today. Our financial systems, our systems of governance, political control and influence are all really controlled by a small group of people who don't have the best interests in mind at times. Check out Hane's book at behane, B-E-E-H-A-N-E dot org, also available on Amazon. Um, you can check it out on Audible as well. And I think you'll enjoy the stories that we share today. Thanks so much for your time and leave us a review if you enjoyed the, today's episode. Cheers. Hey. Welcome back to Lisbon. Thank How does you. it feel? Oh, it feels wonderful. It took me maybe 24 hours to get uh, readjusted sure. um, after uh, these intense travels and after uh, participating in COP. But I'm now kind of really happy to be mm. back, engaging again with the Lisbon scene, art mm. scene. The weather is beautiful. I'm so <laughs> <I> grateful. <know. laughs> me too. <laughs> Uh, just before we came into the studio, just standing out in the sun, just like soaking it in like mm. a bath. Um, it's been really nice getting a glimpse of some of your journey uh, at COP. And you made it into the local media I for your know. book. It's so <laughs> cool. Um, give us a snapshot. I've never been to COP. What was it like for you? Was this your first time? Have you been before? What was your role? Um, and then obviously we're going to devote the lion's share of our time together to your book, which... Um, I was really surprised how deeply it moved me. Um, I, it was kind of a wave. I obviously like knew you and your luminosity and just your brilliance. And I was like, okay, there's something here. But um, it was kind of layers and layers of unfolding. And it's going to take me some, some time to process. But yeah, kick us off with COP. Oh, and, uh, what, I'm so glad through. to hear and I can't wait to hear more. But yeah, let's talk about COP. So I was there. It was also my first time going to uh, COP. I engaged uh, previously um, through uh, online talks, but this time I was in person and I was going there for two reasons. So first of all, um, the book that I published, I published it with the publishing house that's based in Dubai. So they okay, had a couple nice. of events 
for me, a book talk and a workshop. Nice. And in addition to that, obviously, it was an opportunity to um, engage with, uh, you know, mm -hmm. organizations that are participating at COP. One of our partners at the Sovereign Nature Initiative, uh, She Changes Climate, was holding a high-level multi-stakeholder panel uh, mm. at the Women's Pavilion, but I also spoke at the Green Blockchain Conference giving a keynote. So nice. that was the very beginning, hey. just after landing in Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> On stage. It was wonderful. I think I really enjoyed this time. I mean, such a big event. People need mm. to realize what having 100,000 people flying from all over the world coming together mm. to discuss uh, climate action uh, means, you know. Yeah. I would say give 30% of those people are able to go to the blue zone, have, you know, yeah. accreditations are part of, you know, um, official delegations. And um, maybe, yeah, 70%, the rest is, is, is in the green zone. And in the green zone, that's where I was. Yeah. Um, you have a number of incredible activities. You have uh, uh, pavilions for countries. It was held at the Expo Dubai, so where they held mm. uh, univer the Universal Exhibition in 2020. Uh, so, you know, you see a lot of that. The, my first day, I actually went to see the work of Rafik Anadol, who is an mm. amazing uh, digital architect and artist and using um, AI uh, with with data from nature to kind of like display the power of nature. It's a, a very immersive experience in the dome. That was wow. fabulous. Wow. Um, and then you had a number of people, you know, the ReFi community was there, very supportive, very enthusiastic. <laughs> that was an amazing experience Love to have it. them around. So good. Um, and yeah, kind of understanding what the, you know, Web3 and blockchain scene looks like in, in, uh, in Dubai, the funding um, possibilities as well. Like I realized there's so much money uh, yeah. in the region going to uh, Web3 projects, which is, of course, of interest when we're trying to push for, you know, um, kind of raising the awareness of that space uh, regarding mm -hmm. ecology and mm -hmm. contribute to, to the work of conservation organizations, which is what we're doing at the Sovereign Nature Initiative. So, yeah, yeah. overall, a fantastic experience. I've also uh, had the chance to discover the amazing places of Dubai. So the Opera House, the Museum of the Future. Yeah, I went to visit awesome. uh, uh, um, Cora Vita, which is a project mm -hmm. by a friend of mine, uh, Sam Teicher, uh, who's now funded um, uh, and supported in the UAE and, and, and Saudi Arabia, uh, a project dedicated to um, kind of uh, uh, developing technology to, to, yeah, to recreate uh, coral reefs uh, okay. and Beautiful. regenerate coral reefs. It, it's, oh. it was, it's just amazing. And I think I didn't realize how much that could be of interest for the region. Mm. And I think that's one mm. of the... Um, the good uh, outcomes of this, uh, my participation is that it kind of shattered some of the um, uh, perspectives that I had on the region because, of sure. course, uh, the UAE is a petrostate and yeah. uh, it, it was a very controversial COP. However, it did deliver on many aspects at yeah. the end of the day in terms of the text that was adopted, you know, like a mention of moving away from fossil fuel, however, not phasing it out. So, you mm, know, mm. Uh, some countries were disappointed and obviously yeah. activists were disappointed, but it was also the most inclusive COP. And I think people forget mm. how, you know, challenging it is for women to make it into that space. And yep. they had amazing negotiators, female negotiators. So I think a lot of it is, is, a, is a positive outcome. Yeah. Um, and I'm excited to see where that takes us, especially the operationalization of the loss and damage fund, okay. um, which was, you know, uh, expected for a long time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think if anything, I just find that this event and this gathering allowed for creating shared language around mm. uh, what is important uh, moving forward in terms of climate action. Yeah, and there's so many different moving parts from coral reef restoration to... Um, yeah, loss and damages and voluntary contributions. There's like this massive ecosystem moving towards sometimes the same direction, but also mm. speaking different languages. I'm curious how you found communicating the work at Sovereign Nature Initiative. How did people respond? And also this actually um, will probably drop before Ale's episode. So I'd love for you to just give an outline mm -hmm. of the work that you're doing at SNI and your role in it and how people received what you're doing at COP. Absolutely. So at the Sovereign Nature Initiative, we're a nonprofit bridging conservation organizations with Web3, mm -hmm. trying to develop sustainable funding streams for conservation organizations that usually rely on philanthropic giving, which is too scarce. It's only 2% yeah. of global philanthropy that goes into that space mm -hmm. and not exactly um, distributed in a way that's uh, the most efficient. And 
surely not transparent enough. So no. with the capabilities of the Web3 space, we're trying to flip the economics and, and really support the work of land stewards. Uh, the way we do that is by receiving data from them, so eco-data, processing it through what we call the Decentralized Ecological Economics Protocol, DEEP, Deep yeah. um, and then uh, providing it to content creators, and that could be gaming um, communities, Web3 gaming communities, or that could be, you know, event organizers, like for instance for uh, Sub-Zero in, in September, we did a beautiful campaign with data from uh, marine wildlife conservation in Portugal, and we created mm. those eco-derivatives that were tied to proof of attendance. Nice. And for us, we consider them kind of a, of a proof of care. And we think uh, these wildlife NFTs and this approach in general is, is totally scalable yeah. for as long 100%. as we, again, share a common language and, and a common understanding of how urgent and important this action is. So this mm. is uh, a little bit of what we do at the Sovereign Nature Initiative. I was really pleasantly surprised to see mm. how... Um, how well received the message was, especially at the Green Blockchain Conference. So many people came to me afterwards, yes. to, you know, offering, you know, uh, possibilities to co-develop projects, grants, uh, you know, discussions on refining our technology and, and things like this. And at the other panel that I took part in, that was more of an institutional panel, I realized I was the only person uh, kind of making sure that nature was sitting at the table. So mm. there was people usually in those conversations, they, they, they differentiate the conversation on uh, climate and nature. There is a specific COP uh, uh, held by UNFC3, uh, and the next one is going to be, I think, in November. Mm -hmm. But it's f for some reason, people don't see how important that is to have the conversations tied up together because, yeah, I mean, when you talk about the consequences of climate change, the most obvious to me at least is is how, uh, you know, negative that is and, and uh, lethal that is for the wildlife and for yeah. nature and the biodiversity loss that so many every everywhere around the globe we are facing. So I think it was, uh, it was really welcome also because we're coming with a solution and mm. we're coming from the perspective and it's a humbling perspective. We know we're having, we're trying, you know, yeah. Uh, it's at, we're a startup at the end of the day. We're trying. We made a number of projects that we call proof of concepts, mm. and but we're trying to to use the, the, these capabilities that everyone understands. Is, it's it's a promising space. Mm. So I think it was really welcome, and um, I can't wait to again develop those conversations together, also with institutions, because I realized UN organizations typically tend to be perceived and rightfully so, as kind of uh, enormous organizations mm. with a mm. lot of bureaucracy and n n not making a decision within the U.S. It, it, the U.N. organization is already a decision, you know. And we come from, you know, with an entrepreneurial uh, approach and we really want to move things mm. fast. Mm. Um, but I think there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of synergies. and totally. And it's about... Um, really being able to navigate those spaces better and having the people that can open doors. Mm. So that's why our participation was key. And uh, again, can't wait to have uh, to see the results of, of uh, this participation in the next few weeks. Absolutely. And also that you're acting upon these ideas and actively raising capital for these organizations. I think I remember Ale saying it's close to $200,000 or something that you've raised across um, just a handful of proof of concepts. And you know, this is real money going to real wildlife preservation on the ground with effectively no interference. You Absolutely. Know? And, and you have this increased level of confidence about where the capital is going. But um, we obviously have a whole episode dedicated to that space and I really hear more to talk about you and this book that you've just published, Being Other. Um, I wonder if you would take us a step back and rewind to how you got into this space. You've obviously had a pretty adventurous journey. You've mm -hmm. experienced a lot in your life. And you've um, encapsulated some of your knowledge and your lived experience in this initial book. I'm sure there'll be many to come. But for those who haven't had a chance to read it yet, maybe just give us a teaser of what the journey's been like. Sure, absolutely. So, yes, this is my first published book. And I think um, the idea for me and, and 
goes back to two years ago, let's say. And it was a, a massive transition for me. I was stepping away from my role at this small Africa Pan-African organization where I did some policy advisory for African governments to help mm -hmm. them kind of create better conditions for entrepreneurs. And in general, I was moving away from, you know, four years entirely dedicated to African entrepreneurship and innovation, kind of asking myself whether I was putting my energy in the right place, what, why has it been so difficult Difficult and what can I learn from it and and what are the next steps? So that was kind of two years ago. Um, I, I started uh, kind of reflecting back on my journey, uh, mm. let's say. Um, I, I grew up in Morocco. I was fortunate enough to also study in France and the US. I started my career in France as a consultant working for, you know, large corporates uh, on <laughs> digital transformation projects. Yeah. But at the same time, my real aspiration was to contribute to change. And mm. the way I did it at the time was to partake in nonprofit organizations, help uh, set up um, an, um, an incubator, uh, helping women that have suffered violence uh, to, to kind of... Uh, create projects that will help them kind of be reintegrated into society. And at the same time, I was writing a number of articles about what I was witnessing from afar mm. in terms of innovation in yeah. the Mediterranean space and with a, an understanding of, you know, I, I come from Morocco. Morocco is this very interesting place where it's at the juncture of so many cultures. Totally. It's Africa. It's the Arab world. It has a lot of European influence. It's open to America. Um, and there's a lot going on at the moment. And, you know, the rest of the Arab world and Morocco as well has, has gone to, uh, through um, the Arab Spring. So mm -hmm. what does it mean for the youth? What are the aspirations? So I was writing with that lens. Um, but, of course, it, in me it was growing an immense desire to be of service. Mm -hmm. So whenever it was possible, whenever I decided to kind of step away from that full-time job, um, get trained, um, I did a, a coding boot camp uh, with, a, with a startup, um, moved to Barcelona for that. I, so started, cool. I started imagining what it could bring to, yeah. to the youth back home. And then a few months down the line, I, I went back home, I actually mm. brought the, the, the project back, but I had another project of mine, which was to design a program that was more suitable for marginalized youth and mm. women in particular mm. in rural areas. So the cool. most you know, people that were very remote from yeah. the possibilities, the immense possibilities that the, the the startup world was promising. And I started knowing that I, I had, you know, the, the luxury of a few months of, of uh, runway, but, uh, but also not knowing what the space was like. So I kind of discovered everything, <laughs> went to talk to everyone, started doing mapping exercises because I realized, you know, it was about... Um, giving that hope also to many members of the diaspora who all had immense affection and wanted mm. to contribute, however, did not know how to do so. And for sure, they didn't, they didn't know because uh, locally we didn't have much support. I didn't have much support, which I realized uh, a few years down the line in going to other countries was not something that was... Um, you know, in other countries, they do provide a lot of support. I went to Rwanda a year into my endeavors, and Rwanda was very open. They mm. helped me kind of like uh, listed all the people that I needed to meet. Like I had a whole schedule for three weeks wow. done for me, wow. which of course was not happening in Morocco. So anyway, so whenever I dived back into that space and uh, as a repatriate entrepreneur, I faced a number of challenges, of course. Mm. You're young, you're a woman. Uh, people don't understand quite what the, the mm. value proposition is because what is a boot camp like and sure. you want to make it social impactful but eventually uh, it was a, a journey of evangelization and then eventually I also took part in many other Pan-African initiatives with other entrepreneurs that had a similar desire mm. to shift the narrative of the continent and kind of use the possibilities of technology to bring power back to communities and mm. so um, they you know all of us kind of understood that we couldn't just stay there and do our job. We had to do many other jobs and really, um, you know, influence uh, decision makers, change uh, the legal context that was so yeah. not favorable. It's 
some of the, you know, Africa is like one of the continents where it's so hard to build mm. a business, uh, even more so when it's uh, an innovative startup. Yeah. So uh, I took part in those initiatives and eventually I was approached to take a role with the, this Pan-African organization that is meant to, it's called Smart Africa and it's meant to kind of harmonize the the legal framework or the, the strategy around the digital transformation of the continent. And it was a fantastic experience in so many ways. I lived in Rwanda. It was during the pandemic, so it was really hard oh on, in that sense. But at the same time, I learned so much about the mm. behind the scenes of multi-stakeholder negotiation, and it's tough. It's mm. difficult. Um, but yeah, it got me a little bit puzzled at times, and I think this is why I needed to step, step away and just... Um, understand my own narrative within this complex uh, system change narrative. And I think for me, the, the, um, the, the impetus of writing this book was kind of realizing that through my endeavors, I was looking for healing aspects of mm. my identity that were not necessarily welcome, celebrated, and also, you know, transforming some of the difficult experiences and some of the difficult emotions into fuel for change. Um, and so I came up with the idea of writing my lessons from the beginning of my career. So it yeah. was uh, the book was initially called Integrity Lessons from the Beginning until mm. I started working on it and eventually found a publishing house that was perfectly aligned. Yes. I mean, when we talk about universe delivering yes. on your on your prayers, it was fascinating. Um, so I was put in touch with that publishing house that is a female-led publishing house dedicated to amplifying diverse voices. And when we started to work together, I kind of realized that the the common the commonality of of the experiences was uh, having been the minority of minority mm. in many different contexts and in doing so embodying that possibility for change yeah. but also receiving a lot of pushback so how do we navigate gracefully and so what could I make of these experiences what kind of lessons how could I provide this and offer this to other generations of change makers mm. so that it's not loss of an experience, you know. Yeah. So that was the intention uh, at the beginning. And now it's just so crazy to think it's out there. And I've already <laughs> been to so many countries during this book tour. tour. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. And I think what you shared there around being a minority of the minority reminds me of one of these principles of design thinking around if you're trying to create something new, you really want to design for the edges, the fringes. And also in permaculture, um, the the intersections between two ecosystems are often the ones that are most biodiverse and have some very key patterns and clues for how we can really create a thriving and vibrant living ecosystem that takes care of itself and doesn't require external intervention. And so I think there's there's a lot of models that I've started recognizing really amplify this idea of recognizing that black and indigenous women of color do have this incredible model of regenerative leadership that we really need for this transition to a regenerative economy. And part of your book, I was really struck by this kind of description of you know how much violence and persecution and prejudice and hatred and just downright personal and systemic injustice um, that people of these orientations have experienced and the healing that's required to go through in order to stand with confidence and courage and integrity for not only our own well-being, but also for the well-being of all of life. And I think this is, for me, kind of gives me shivers to recognize because we are now sitting in this highly extractive, toxic, male-dominated, white-led society that is really pushing against the brink of every possible boundary on Earth. And we need a new model. We need a new model for leadership. We need a new model for communication and also for personal growth. And I feel like there's there's so much in your lived experience and in the book that kind of gives clues for other people regardless of their orientation of what this path could be as individuals and as an organization. I'm, I'm curious what it was about this particular time, though. You could have shared these insights at any moment in your journey. Like, why was now so important? And why is this also important for the regenerative finance and kind of the tech community as a whole? Thank you for that question. Uh, I think the time is now. Um, I think, uh, in, yeah, in my perspective, I, I started this um, journey of becoming a change maker mm. 
brushing into, you know, designing, crafting, creating companies. And there's a lot you can achieve with that. Of course, we, you know, with uh, be it, uh, the, the coding school or the nonprofit in Morocco mm. or the other communities that I started to, to reach out and be part of um, and contribute to uh, a lot of impact. But I think when it comes to condensing um, knowledge and, and kind of... Uh, appreciating how that can contribute to a larger body of work. You know, in the book, I mentioned a number of um, people that have mm. inspired me mm. that are women of color, but not exclusively, and that have uh, a similar understanding of what's at stake now and mm. why we need to have those new references when it comes to understanding the knowledge that is necessary to make sure that more and more people uh, liberate their their potential for for change. So I think for me it was it was this time of okay, well, I am going through a transition myself. Mm. It feels like all the spaces I'm navigating are also seeking something different and yes. something new. And it gave me that opportunity to have those conversations. I interviewed a number mm. of women throughout this time and kind of realized, well, yeah, there is now more and more literature informing the, yeah. the, the, the situations that they are facing. You know, at, at some point I came across this McKinsey report on mm. uh, women of color in leadership. And, and great, you know, there's more data and that's informing some decision making and some creation of new projects. But I think for me, it was also a matter of making it more personal, like mm. really offering some of my experience in, in the most vulnerable way to yeah. say, well, this is what I have experienced. This is how I've interpreted it. And in addition to that, it, the book is meant to be really practical. So every mm. chapter has exercises, um, which, again, is meant to feed uh, other programs, other communities, uh, so that people can play with that and, and really make it their own so that yeah. uh, so uh, it has kind of like this possible ripple effect. Uh, mm. But I think the time is now, truly. I think we're coming together with new language, I can see that in the refi community. It's fascinating. Mm. We now have, you know, we relate more to certain frameworks and, and uh, vocabulary and, and, and people have, we all need hope and we all mm. need strategy. So if anything, yep. this is a contribution to that. Mm. I, I, yeah, I love the exercise. I think it was the first or second chapter around really breaking down the components of our identity. Because identity is this very amorph or amorphous term but I, I guess for whatever reason, you know, your lived experience has really given you this embodied um, understanding of identity in all these different ways, given your background, your upbringing, your education in France, you know, all the work that you've done. And to really see this as, you know, it is a system in a way, our, the structure of our identity and also shows us where our surface area for triggers or pain and exposure might be. But also these are kind of the clues to where our greatest contributions and our greatest gifts can be. I'm I'm curious how you would describe your own identity now and how it's evolving through this process, having written the book, and how you would invite other people to lean into working with identity in this space of creating positive change and a better world. Absolutely. So if you allow me, I think I'll answer this question by uh, reading Do. one please, paragraph please. Um, from the introduction. So who am I and how am I showing up? I am a North African cisgender woman, Arab and African, and worldly in many ways, but only by earned privilege that I'm spending on lifting other women and minority groups in the best ways I know until I know better. I come with the understanding that the creative leadership I believe in is a commitment to progress. I am because we are, and I appreciate every single person who invited me to expand my horizons and my freedom and assert the sacred integrity of my purpose and my vision. I'm also grateful for those who did the opposite, putting roadblocks in my path out of misogyny or racism or some other twisted power dynamic. Those roadblocks challenged me, allowed me to sit better in the very special place of unshakable dignity and sense of self-worth, self-respect, self-love. Mm. That's so beautiful. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this exercise about uh, the components of our identity and how it's playing um, sometimes against us in the, in the context we, we navigate is an invitation eventually to refine our appreciation of what is ours to mm -hmm. take and grow into 
um, empathy for oneself and for the rest of the world and, and into self-love. Um, and I, I love this first exercise. It was inspired by a Nigerian-American woman. Um, and then I kind of took it to, to, um, to a next stage to, to, to go in a little bit deeper into how being this or that gender, being perceived this or that, this or that class, um, but also lived experiences. You know, I talk in the book about, of course, how my approach to life has been affected by um, loss from family members early on. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, a, a enormous appetite to um, make sense of the value of life and the contribution that I can make um, because otherwise it's too painful. Mm, yeah. um, so I think, yeah, I think this is the invitation through this book, Being Other. And also it, it seems as though we're kind of developing this capacity to overcome conflict with other people as a result of our differences and our similarities. I remember a moment early on in the book where you describe you know, being welcomed to a house party in Paris with a very kind of acrid uh, remark. I think they said something like, oh, look, we've got our own Arab here or something after a terrorist attack had happened recently. And hearing you struggle with this internal dynamic of like when to draw boundaries, when to confront someone, how to express your own emotion, how to deal with the pain in that moment, like when to be compassionate versus otherwise... And I feel as though this is a really pivotal skill that we need to learn because it's so easy to otherwise just say, oh, well, screw you, you're not my friend anymore, or we're not going to work together, we're not going to collaborate, and to isolate ourselves and become buried in a shell of protection. What have you learned in this dynamic around when people really trigger you mm. and hit you? Like, what's your internal response and where do you go from there? Mm. Something I realized early on is that as eloquent um, and smart you can be, uh, you're never prepared mm. to receive a rejection and being othered, um, especially from people that you consider friends or close to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. But ultimately, it is not an exercise of eloquence. It's an exercise of integrity. And so I think... Um, Sticking to the very important premise of what mm. makes a uh, worthwhile, authentic relationship. Mm. And that starts with being open to the other person and um, being open to being seen and mm. so being vulnerable, uh, creating that sense of intimacy. And from there, yes, expressing what is a trigger, what is a boundary and what is not. I remember... Uh, one of the first readers of this book is a good friend of mine. She's in her 70s. She's Israeli. And she mm. is a woman who did immense work for peace mm. uh, in Gaza in particular. Oh. And when she read that paragraph, she was, you know, uh, she said something about, you know, it's funny because uh, at least in like uh, the very Ashkenazi sense of humor, I, I don't think this would have uh, shocked anyone, you know. Mm. And from hearing this from her, and she's a fantastically kind person, mm. uh, it kind of made me reflect back. It's true true, most likely this friend of mine did not realize how hurtful her comment could have sure. been. And maybe, you know, on the other side, people that are very uh, strict about what is politically correct, what is acceptable, sure. not acceptable, um, would are completely outraged. I was really hurt by this yeah, comment because it was a time, you know, of you know, massive attack that had, had just happened in Paris. I was feeling super lonely. Of course. And then you're, you're pushed even further into your loneliness. <laughs> Oh by this comment, but I think uh, if anything, that made me reflect on what I had, I I was supposed to do in showing up authentically in this relationship, mm. and in terms of, you know, this is who I am, and I want to be respected this way, and I want to be welcomed this way, and I need this from you, mm, you know, mm. and that particular moment, if anything, I would not, I would have needed a massive hug. hug yeah. um, so yeah, so I think this yeah it's uh, it's the second chapter of the book, uh, speaking your truth gracefully and mm -hmm. inviting us to to develop the skills because as you said, very few of us now show up in a in a conversation that can be an actual dialogue, mm. uh, open to being challenged yeah, in their ideas, totally. not trying to convince or force mm. uh, something else onto another or judge for that matter, yeah. and it takes constant uh, unlearning and, and, and recreating the conditions of safety yeah. um, for, um, for intimacy. Yeah, and, and also I think there's this 
unfolding story of self that's evolving around what it actually means to be human. As we look at how we've othered everything in the world around us, creating the separation between us and nature, us and our neighbors, um, we're recognizing that actually it's having very deep catastrophic impacts on ourselves, our lived experience, on our children. And I'm curious how you see this kind of othering of people, this um, yeah, deeply interwoven, multi-generational systemic injustice around groups of people that are in positions of power and groups of people who've been marginalized and are really at the hardest effects of these systemic challenges, climate change, biodiversity cups being one of them. Like, how does the people equation really play into, say, the work that you're doing at SNI with biodiversity and conservation? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you see these systems integrating together? Because this is obviously a very clear picture in your mind, but Mm -hmm. I think it's easy for people to kind of segment and box these things. We're like, okay, over here, this is equity, and over here, this is carbon. You know, and it's nice to put in boxes, but I'm just curious, like, Mm -hmm. how you see these systems interacting together. Yeah, and it's as if you couldn't contribute to one without deciding to contribute less to the other. For Mm -hmm. me, the the root cause is the same. It's Mm -hmm. this notion of disconnecting our from our hearts, from mm-hmm. what makes us uh, part of nature. Yeah. Um, and I think many people, I mean, all of us can learn from nature and the way it balances itself out, the way uh, animals develop symbiotic relationships and, mm. and, the, and the cycles of nature as well and the way we need to function better uh, to move away from like extra productive uh, approach to to our lives uh, to actually being um, I, I do see for me yeah, the, all the like all the symptoms in terms of inequities uh, and and climate uh, mm. uh, the climate disasters we're facing mm. and so on the root cause is the same as this inca- lack of or disconnect really mm. from from uh, from the source and and I think w- what we're trying to do with Sovereign Nature Initiative belongs to systemic change as mm. a whole. And I think mm. one of the drivers of systemic change for a lot of people is having been reacquainted to the power of oneness and mm. seeing uh, the connections the, uh, being interwoven. Yeah. And, and this philosophy that uh, I mentioned at times in the book, Ubuntu, I am because we are, we're completely yes. interconnected. So how do we ensure this, that this interconnectedness plays in our favor and, and, and curate constantly mm. the most favorable conditions to relating, connecting, generating projects together, advancing humanity. And I think for me, um, if at times we move away from that, then we're on the wrong track. And Certainly. it is part yeah, of absolutely. our it is part of our commitment to being human to make mm. sure that we are um, on track, but also we we engage others mm. that are you know taken aback by their own uh, emotional baggage, trauma, uh, and are unhappy ultimately. Yeah. Uh, I think purpose brings a lot of happiness and and I think doing this together brings Im- immense happiness and hope. And yeah, the, the journey is not all uh, easy, absolutely not, but we're yeah. here for that. Of course. Yeah, it's not easy and there's also, you know, so many streams that really do work to repress these voices and minimize the, the urgency and the importance of these ideas. And I, I personally have found it hard, um, you know, the idea of Ubuntu is, is so apt and articulate in terms of the heart of what it means to be human. We are our relations. We cannot exist in isolation. We're both an individual and a whole. And yet standing up and talking about this in a financial space where everything is commodified Mm. and everyone is looking for some type of modular systems component to plug into a broken system that will somehow, you know, make things work, it's a really it's a really tough, you know, uphill battle. And I'm, I'm curious to hear like what kind of changes could be made in the regenerative finance space as a whole, also Web3, that can really begin to integrate some of this more, I guess, nurturing and inclusive and, um, yeah, a place of belonging for mm. radical ideas mm. and, mm. and the types of, 
experiences and connections that can really drive this towards real world impact because that's what we're all what we're all driving for. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm curious what what kind of changes you'd you'd see. Absolutely, I think you know the way I've observed the Web three space in the past year and particularly the role of the refi community. I mm-hmm. think. I have a lot of hope, if anything, because I find that in using similar technology, yeah. it is creating a lot of opportunities to develop in common language of yeah. the purpose of this technology. Mm. And I'm finding, uh, again, a lot of uh, hope in seeing how frameworks are developing to make mm. sure that we are understanding that space and the evolution of that space that is not entirely defined. You know, there's yeah. still there's still a lot that can move, which is uh, exciting. Uh, but to make sure that it serves uh, the people on the planet. So mm. that's what I'm finding. And I, I think in, in events that I've taken part in, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of practices, mm. you know, be it, uh, and, and you do this so well, John, in, mm. in the events that you're facilitating. You start with meditation. Mm. Uh, we usually end up in ecstatic dance. And I think, <laughs> no, but that, crea- you know, it's, yes. it's, it's something really powerful yeah. because people kind of understand that it's important to be themselves yeah. and to celebrate together just like it is important to think together and mm. come up with solutions together. So in, you know, again, weaving this, uh, e- the relationality, yeah. ultimately it's about this. And it's not something that you can do so easily just kind of uh, using your assumptions. Yeah. It's something to really show up to in the most uh, intentional way. I think that's this is what I find promising in that space. So, mm. um, and, and I'm finding, you know, in the work that I'm doing with the Sovereign Nature Initiative, knocking at doors to develop projects, that there is this appetite. You know, no yeah. one kind of like closes the doors to us and says, you know, it's not of interest. <laughs> <laughs> this no. sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, everyone is super excited. Yeah. Excited yeah. about the initiative. It is a very lovable initiative because everyone understands that mm. they need to do a lot more yeah. to uh, make sure that nature is taken into account, that we use uh, the, 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 the body of knowledge of the blockchain space to to serve the, yes. the this idea and this vision, mm. so I'm um, if, again, if anything, I'm hopeful. Now it's a matter of time, mm. and it's mm. a matter of uh, pushing the needle and 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 kind of uh, constantly bringing and fueling this space with those ideas, yeah. um, because it goes at times fast and also very slowly. Um, yeah, and I think you described earlier around uh, your book being a contribution to this broader space, having a long-term time horizon to see this community and this journey towards realizing a regenerative future is is really kind of um, yeah, just comforting to me because these complex systemic challenges are often slow moving and we see small but incremental compound marginal gains and I remember you saying that, you know, this year's COP was the most diverse and maybe there was like 35% women there instead of um, what it obviously should be, which is parity. Um, but we're making progress. And I think kind of pausing to recognize those moments of progress as well as identifying, you know, specific places and areas for improvement are so important. I remember very specifically in my own journey, um, I just had my second son born. I was looking at Refi podcast. I was working with John X to create a list of people to have on the show. And he just very kindly pointed out to me that they were all white men. Mm. And I had not seen that, Mm -hmm. you know? And it was just like, oh, yeah, you're right. (laughs) Like, hang on a second. Mm. And so there does, you know, require this level of awareness and intentionality around who we bring to the table and how the table is shaped and what kind of conversations we have. And also, I think, this balance between knowing and not knowing. There's a sort of new kind of leadership emerging as we're bringing these very diverse groups of people together. And as a leader, holding space for diverse, often competing ideas, Mm -hmm. opinions, emotions to work towards a shared vision of a better future. Mm -hmm. And I think this really is, to me, the kernel of a very exciting movement that can tackle these complex existential challenges. But it feels as though like leadership itself is having to grow and emerge. I know you've done a lot of work in this. You mentioned Susan Barnes' course and this idea of like sensuous knowledge that was really rich for me. I didn't really understand what it meant at first, um, but I'd be very curious, 
looking at this as a, a source of wisdom for leaders in the regenerative space. Like, what is it? How do you define the term? And what's your kind mm-hmm. of lived experience of mm-hmm. this in, in your practice mm-hmm. as a leader? Absolutely. I think in the book, I start by talking about atypical leadership because mm-hmm. I, I mentioned a number of anecdotes and discussions that I've had uh, at times being solicited for leadership positions and eventually being rejected for the very reason that I was young and a woman and things that I couldn't <laughs> change, really. And uh, yeah, it sounds ridiculous, but it still uh, exists. So um, I, 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 throughout the book, I mention a number of resources and, and yes, absolutely, this the, the work of Mina Salami, who calls herself an Afrofeminist mm-hmm. and uh, who coined this term of sensuous knowledge, kind of claiming and, 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 and also making people understand that we usually use terms and, and logics that belong to uh, a body of work that was mainly designed by white men. Mm. Um, and if you even look at the publishing space, it's very hard for black, indigenous, and women of color to make yeah. it. Now, there is change, and of course, this is also a contribution. But when we talk about the sensuous knowledge and, and we shift the the approach to appreciating what mm. sources that are less, you know, academic, logical, can also inform and have a wealth of, of wisdom, then you want at your table those uh, black, indigenous, and women of color from all places around mm. the globe because you know that through their storytelling, through their singing, through their other uh, embodiment practices, mm. they will be able to uh, shift the, the decision-making much deeper uh, than any conversation that will be, you know, back-to-back arguments and logics and, and doing the math and things mm. like this. Mm. So I think from the moment we open ourselves to these possibilities, then nature speaks for herself yes. and we have to listen. And I'm particularly excited at this period of time because I'm seeing how, you know, the technology space is is moving into a direction where we will be able to have those conversations with nature in, mm. ter- in, in ways that are easy, understandable, digestible for us. And, you know, that will potentially integrate some of the knowledge and wisdom that were passed on by people like shamans or people that have a p- very particular relationship to nature that ha- have been able to to, um, to develop uh, this relationship. Although I do believe everyone mm. of us has this potential. Yeah. So it's just a matter of how much intention you're putting into mm. it. Um, so, yeah, so I think uh, my perspective is that we we would be missing out in not understanding that knowledge need to be understood in its most sensuous way. Um, And and there is a wealth of possibilities now that you include in the conversation and you make it really a priority for everyone to feel uh, welcome, respected, to feel that they belong so that they can raise those voices and these ideas and and craft uh, new projects together. Totally. And, and also recognizing that indigenous communities steward over 80% of the world's biodiversity and really are the only predominant living examples of human societies mm-hmm. that live in harmony with nature. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's working here. Yeah. If and, anything, we need to serve them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Totally. Mm-hmm. I 100%, 100% agree. And, and also recognize, you know, where our, our values are are different and where are the systems that we have built are radically out of alignment with the needs of our own bodies of our own heart of our own mind and nature as you know as we are apart and i think this is for me a really interesting invitation it reminds me of the story that sep Kamvar describes of like the eagle and the condor this old myth that really is describing you know the change that human civilization is going through where we had this um, you know male white enlightenment led era of everything cerebral, everything measurable, everything quantifiable. And this empirical age has brought us so much incredible technologies and tools to create, but also to destroy. And we now see that accumulating wealth for personal profit, no matter how deep our balance sheet is, doesn't really matter if we're alone, if our water is polluted, if the people around us are suffering, and if the planet is Mm. on fire. Like, it really doesn't matter. And so recognizing the source of deep embodied wisdom through indigenous communities who have been practicing for thousands of years ways to live in harmony with each other and in nature 
um, to see this emergence and recognizing that in a way, neither in their own right have the full picture to move forward. But we need to integrate these two ways of being in the world in order to move forward in a way that people on the planet can live in harmony. Is that kind of how you see it? Or do you see a different model? Like, I'm just curious, you know, these kind of two archetypes and and how they're working together towards, you know, paving a way to a regenerative future. The way I see it is that we're now at the cusp of a massive change and we don't know quite well how we yeah. can frame it to make it work for everyone. There are uh, possibilities and I think, um, again, the... Refi community and other change makers are coming uh, with propositions that are really mm -hmm. solid propositions. But at the same time, we have to battle against a an, an system that is dying, that is mm -hmm. still with, with people that are still in power, that have a lot yeah. of power. Um, and, and they have a hard time kind of even imagining how things could look like differently. And they're still yeah. very encroached into their thinking of muddy and the bottom line matters. And anything that is not computed into that uh, does not really matter. And so this is why, you know, organizations like ours are trying to find the clever way to speak that language, yeah. reconfiguring nature's uh, value and kind of kind of creating a, a bridge uh, to to still speak in money terms of something that is invaluable mm. uh, is is trying to make the system work for mm. for for nature, but I recognize that it's only an attempt, and at times I think just like a lot of change makers, I'm tempted to you know think of just moving away from that system. Yep. But I also recognize that uh, the the attempts of communities that have moved away entirely from new capitalistic uh, approaches have only worked at a very small scale and for mm -hmm. limited periods of time. So I think we still need to put a lot of uh, mind and heart into it uh, to understand areas of improvement yeah. of the, the where we stand now and how can we ease ourselves into a system that works for everyone. And like you said, ultimately, um, it is the indigenous communities that are taking care of the, the planet best. So if the rest of us are embedded in a system uh, that is not conducive to restoration, biodiversity preservation, and so on, mm. we have to limit the, the negative consequences and really reshape it entirely. Yeah. Uh, be because, I mean, eventually you can decide on your own that you're going to be part of one of these communities, but maybe your, your better position is to raise awareness among mm. other people that can... Uh, can serve them. So, and how do we create this harmony? And I think we're all, again, attempting, and there are a few solutions that are emerging. And organizing this collective intelligence is an immense challenge that we need to take on yeah. based on the principles that we discussed before in terms of uh, um, authentic dialogue yeah. um, and wanting to enact upon these decisions. From a basis of mutual respect and a desire to have long working relationships, knowing that the person across the table, if we disagree, we're going to be working across the table with them for decades because this isn't a problem that we're going to solve overnight. Mm. And I think for me, you know, communities like traditional Dream Factory are a very interesting example of the confluence of these different movements coming together. Um, for those who aren't familiar, village down south, have you been? To yeah, have? absolutely. Like 90 minutes. Um, and the idea of you know living together in nature, using technology to help to finance and to reward you know regenerative behaviors um, is a very interesting model because I found myself drawn to the city because there's people here and I want to be in relationship and I want to experience the diverse culture mm. and art and music mm. and you know amazing podcast studios. But actually, what if we can really create deep communities of mm. care where we're able to have this kind of deep relating while also, extending a good portion of our time to physically participate mm. in the act of regeneration. Mm. Mm. And I think this is so missing in in this space, not only recognizing that um, the movement we've built is often monolithic and doesn't fairly represent the people on the planet, let alone the people who have you know, the embodied experience of these solutions, 
but also that we spend most of our time in cities. Mm. And not many of us have actually participated in on-the-ground regeneration work. And I, I don't know about you, but I feel like this just increasing deep longing to be in nature. 100%. And yeah, wh- what are your practices? Like, how do you... F- maintain that connection mm-hmm. to your inner compass. You obviously talk a lot about dance and movement towards mm-hmm. the end of the book, but um, yeah, very curious what gives you that inner fire mm-hmm. and that inner resonance. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think um, you mentioned TDF and I really uh, love what these guys are about. Uh, it's one of the first you know, journey journeys outside of Lisbon that I, uh, I oh, did nice. when, I, when I moved to Portugal a year and a half ago. I do think that they are a model of a regenerative community. And I mentioned in chapter three the importance of such regenerative communities. Maybe not all of us can mm. do at all times, be there, connected to nature, but we can definitely find ways to uh, carve time to yeah. be in nature and do something for nature, plant trees, mm-hmm. you know, take care of animals, work for a sanctuary, whatever the case may be. Um, I I do sense whenever I'm, you know, in the city too much or traveling too much that I, I need time with the ocean. I mm. honestly, mm. I, I love living in Lisbon because it allows me to go to the forest in the morning and the ocean in the afternoon. So nice. And I like to write poetry. <laughs> and so most of the time I'm having those conversations with poetry. Mm. Oh, and really? to be completely honest, you know, I, I also... Every day I wake up with really funky dreams uh, that I remember. In all of my dreams, there there's wildlife. So Uh this morning there was a a beautiful uh, like moment designing flowers in the ocean. Last night (laughs) it was having a play with lions and the whales. So I kind of realized that even if I'm not able to be completely immersed in nature, like Mm. I was in East Africa, or you know just a few weeks ago I was in Cape Town and that was Mm. lovely because I could hike in the afternoon. You know, go on to the top of uh, lion's head and and just feel nature, hear the birds every morning. Mm. Um, I I do need to kind of uh, change my schedule to make sure that I'm going to have at least like one, two, three days, uh, even in the countryside, even if it's not as wild as what I've experienced in the past. And um, and yes, like you said, some other more artistic practices Mm. uh, are, are helpful. I mentioned dance and I think in dance, there's a lot of possibilities to be reconnected to nature. You know, some practices like Gaga dance, for instance, you, depending on who guides you, you can kind of embody your spirit animal mm. or um, play with that, essentially. Um, so I, 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 I discovered uh, pelvic dance here in Lisbon. So hey. this uh, Afro-Brazilian uh, dancer who developed a practice around uh, everything you can do with your your uh, pelvic floor, um, and it's so liberating wow. and it's so powerful. I feel super energized when Amazing. I do those practices. So yes, I can only encourage everyone to just uh, reconnect with the truth of your body. Yeah, as a source of so much wisdom, I found um, it it quite moving and almost painful to realize how deeply disconnected I've been from my own body. I um, was a very like high-performing soccer player as a kid and realized that all my physical performance was really searching for external validation, scoring Mm -hmm. goals for my teammates or my coach or my parents or whoever on the sidelines and actually losing the practice and the internal connection of what what really feels right to Mm. me in my body, Mm. what's within my comfort zone and what really builds strength and capacity. And I think it's interesting in a work environment where we're so often online, so often still, so often in front of a screen and disconnected, how it can be very easy to lose connection Mm. to that inner voice and then make decisions in light of, you know, an adrenaline or cortisol spike that is really a survival fight or flight mechanism as opposed to rooted in kind of our, a deeper, our deeper knowing of mm. both what we need and what is right. Mm. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to following your lead, getting into more movement practices. I feel like this is such a, a massive wave in evolution. And yeah, I also recognize that the body is this source of pain, mm. that trauma is stored in the body. Mm. And you mention throughout the book the word intergenerational trauma a few times, which I've glimpsed um, visually and you know an experiential way through medicine journeys mm. and in working, um, yeah, through family dynamics and all these other things. But I'm I'm curious what your take is like. How would you define this mm. intergenerational trauma? Where does it show up, and how does it relate and influence this broader work of mm-hmm. trying to regenerate ourselves and trying mm. to regenerate the earth? 
Yes, I guess in in kind of self reflecting on how I addressed some of uh, some of the situations that were triggering to me, I realized some of the blocks were not necessarily coming from me. It was coming, mm. of course, from my conditioning, but also from things that I was absolutely unable to push away unless I would do really substantial work. And mm. eventually, I decided to do the substantial work, and aided by you know. Therapy, uh, EMDR, plant medicine. Ah, so cool, um, you've done EMDR as well. It's, yeah. it's fabulous. I wow. recommend to everyone, actually. I think it's uh, really powerful because yeah. you dive back into, you know, old memories and mm. how you mm. started to shape beliefs. And it, it, sometimes it can be as, you know, like a really very menial, casual mm. situations, but eventually you decided to limit yourself in yeah. a way that would be very consequential for yeah. the adult you're becoming. So I think uh, we are at a stage where some of us can have access to this. And I mm. think signing up for healing yeah. uh, is is not only something good that you do for yourself, but you do for the collective and for humanity, which mm. is why ever since I started this entrepreneur journey of mine in 2017, it came hand in hand with a lot of... Um, yeah, a lot of intention and resources and time spent discovering many modalities and yeah. seeing what works for me yeah. to kind of be functional as in give my best, totally. but also understand better and deeper what drives me. And I think this helped me really enhance uh, uh, important relationships in mm. my life, like my relationship to my mother, my sister, yeah, my close family, and kind of understand, you know, when we talk about intergenerational trauma, it's things like your great-grandmother might have lived, and I live a life that my grandmothers would n not even have been... Mm. Um, Maybe they would have dreamt of. I, I don't. I don't know. But you know, uh, one of them didn't wasn't even allowed to go to school. And now I'm like traveling the world, uh, getting educated in in the most elite schools, and <laughs> Gosh, participating yes. in those large events, totally. and writing a book, and dancing yeah. on the rooftops of Lisbon. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying it, you yes. know. And I think it's it's. Um, I, I, I'm enjoying it and I'm enjoying it all the more ever since I made peace with the fact that I may be actually leading a better life than mm. my, um, my matri lineage, mm. uh, which sometimes can come with, with guilt, at least from like okay. for women, it's a lot of that. Um, and similarly for men, there's a lot of like transgenerational trauma in terms of what you are able to share in emotions and experience uh, in terms of, you know, yeah, emotional safety and depth. And I mm. think... Uh, in order to to again show up in the most beautiful way uh, in the possibilities to the possibilities of what is between the two of us mm. to to name that festival that I'm co-creating next year. Yes. Um, it's about yeah, kind of doing that work. And and again, I'm so grateful that uh, these modalities are more and more um, available and. The, the work within communities that embrace such practices and such modalities is extremely powerful. Mm. Yeah, and, and absolutely necessary, I think, for everyone who wants to participate in this regenerative movement, you know, the invitation to do the work within to understand our own burdens that we're carrying, sometimes passed down from our parents, sometimes from their parents. And it can be very confusing in a way to begin to unpack this mm. stuff. Because like you described, um, sometimes they're very small kind of kernel experiences that may not seem like the deep trauma that one would associate with, you know, murder or mm. rape or suicide or any of these other travesties people experience. But we all as humans carry trauma in our lives and in our body. And I think having, you know, trauma-informed collaboration mm. and trauma-informed workplaces is so vital because what I've experienced, you know, as a father... Um, is that there are these wounds that we carry that really do operate at such a deep and profound mm. subconscious level and drive some of our you know most profound motivations mm. and are very deeply woven into our habits, into our routines. And I think if, if we don't do this work of healing these wounds that we've all gathered through being human, it's impossible not to, we might end up just recreating systems of the past because it's still stuck. Mm. And, you know, the... From the witching era, witching era to um, you know the conquistadors, there's just all of this mm. historical suffering that mm. that lives in us, and I think we carry guilt, we carry shame, and to be able to have spaces where we can really work through this stuff 
together mm. alone and then build systems and mm. collaborate from this place. I think really is a model of regenerative leadership and the types of organizations we need to make this transition work. Um, so yeah, that's a, a little glimpse there. Um, we've covered a lot of ground today. Uh, I'm super grateful to have a little peek into the amazing mind. Um, I would love for you, if you feel called, maybe read something towards the end of your book. Absolutely. Um, we started a little bit with an intro. Um, but yeah, Hannah would be great to uh, get your take on the close as a teaser for those who want to buy. Thank you. If we care about people, planet, purpose, regenerative and circular business models, decentralization, equity, fluid identities, inclusive workplaces, sensitive and conscious leadership, then women of color are a fount of resources and wisdom to tap into for the benefit of the collective. Their experiences of life are not new to them. This being in life in terms of race and gender is what they've always known and is this very angle that has given them the much needed wisdom and perspective. To be who I am, an Arab and African woman, is a blessing that I hereby offer to the world. If we seek organizations that value human beings beyond productivity and efficiency, beyond numbers and figures, and prioritize meaning, senses, and holistic well-being over shareholder value and the bottom line, then women of color are the trailblazers. These remarkable women have navigated injustices, finding ways to heal and become caretakers of themselves and others while embodying a balanced approach to service. Because they've chosen integrity, choosing integrity has been for them, as it has been for me, a journey of patience and audacity. It entails self-discovery and acceptance, as well as discerning which battles to step back from and which ones to advance toward. It is about knowing which seats to claim and which tables to build. It is a journey of exponential expansion, and choosing integrity is and always will be just the beginning. Mm. Wow. So powerful. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a joy um, to get to know you as a person outside of any box or container or category that we can name. Um, you have a really deep and beautiful essence and power and you've done so much beauty in the world and I'm really looking forward to this journey together in the years to come. And yeah, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pure delight. Thank you. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> Let's go hit up a rooftop. <laughs> thanks, Anna. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the show. I would be so incredibly grateful if you could leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to your podcast. This helps us reach more listeners, attract amazing guests, and ultimately get the story of regeneration out to a wider audience. It takes just a couple seconds and makes a massive difference. Thanks so much. And do let us know if there's any guests that you'd love to hear from. We'd be very grateful to hear from you. Thanks. Thanks.